Welcome, Sen Senator Eric Lesser. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as I've noted, other folks. Hi, Zeta. Hi, Jonathan. Am I the last one? Yes, you're our, you're, you're our final one. So thank you. Uh, as we've been doing, the two of us are going to trade off questions. Uh, it's going to be 15 minutes total. So keep that in mind as you're answering different questions. Um, and But the, the first one to start us off is that kind of ever-present question. Just take a couple minutes to tell us who you are and why you're running. Thanks so much, Jonathan, and thanks, Ada, and thanks, everybody, for bearing with this uh, and sticking with me as the last person. So uh, I'll, I'll assume it was luck of the draw and, uh, and, and nothing and nothing. Alphabetical. That. <laughs> alphabetical. We did alphabetical, to be fair. Uh, no, but I, I appreciate the, the chance to come on. I, I do want to particularly um, thank uh, each of you as an activist uh, for your work. Uh, the first time I really got involved in political activism, I was 16. Uh, and the principal of my high school in, in Western Mass, public high school, Long Meadow High School, called us all into an auditorium, lined a whole bunch of teachers up at the front of the room and said that they weren't coming back next year because of budget cuts. Uh, frankly, because of decisions that had made, get, been made in the building I now work in. I remember being 16 and sitting there and feeling pretty angry uh, that a bunch of kids were being asked to pay the price for bad decisions that had been made somewhere else. Uh, and so we went out and we did a, a prop two and a half override. Uh, many of you have probably been involved in these in your own communities. Uh, we went out and knocked on doors. Uh, and I remember sitting uh, in the town hall uh, the night of the election uh, and watching the town clerk kind of count the ballots and declare uh, that the measure had passed. And one of the teachers who was sitting next to me, she literally ripped up the pink slip that she had been holding in her hand, threw it in the garbage because the vote passing meant that her job had been saved. And so I felt pretty lucky that as a young person, I was able to see, despite the messiness and the frustrations of politics, what a difference it can make uh, in people's lives. And I know we all share that, that view, um, or we wouldn't be on a, on a Zoom on a Saturday afternoon for the, how many hours in are you? <laughs> uh, so I, I just, just want to, again, again, say thank you. So from there, I caught the bug. Uh, and my big break was I uh, went to work for this skinny guy with a funny name from Illinois, uh, Barack Obama. My break was that I got to carry his suitcases all around snowy New Hampshire during the first in the nation primary. Uh, I then traveled with him to 47 states and six countries during the course of his 2008 campaign. Uh, ended up working in the West Wing 40 feet from the front door of the Oval Office for um, David Axelrod. I worked as his assistant. He was at the time the president's senior advisor, then went to work at the Council on Economic Advisors. I was there, worked closely with Elizabeth Ward and her team on the passage of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, worked on the Affordable Care Act and the passage of the Affordable Care Act, was there for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, met LeBron James, met the starting lineup of the Red Sox. There were some uh, to being there, but I was eager to get home uh, to Massachusetts. And the reason I was eager to get home was probably, I think, not dissimilar from why all of you are so involved, which is I had learned and I had been kind of taught that change, you know, doesn't come from the state house. We know, we know change doesn't come from the state house. It doesn't come from City Hall even, or even from the White House. It comes to those places through activism and mobilization. Uh, and so for the last eight years, I've been working in a community that frankly is invisible uh, from de to decision makers on Beacon Hill. At the height of the opioid crisis, worked closely with the Attorney General's office to set up a Narcan bulk purchasing program, <laughs> reduce the price of Narcan, uh, for hundreds of communities across the state. Almost all of the communities represented by where you all live have participated in that. Life or death, if a school nurse shows up at the scene of somebody who has overdosed and has Narcan, the person is likely to live. If they show up and don't have Narcan, the person is likely not to live. At the height of the COVID shutdowns in 2020, we didn't trust Governor Baker to do this on his own, so we wrote into legislation, I led the effort on in the Senate, to um, center the response to communities most impacted by COVID. $600 million went out the door to dry cleaners, to small bodegas, to community restaurants, to nail salons, to barber shops. We wrote into the law that the money had to first go to, to businesses owned by minorities, by immigrants, and located in neighborhoods that were the hardest hit by COVID. 
So what would I do as Lieutenant Governor? Uh, well, first, I understand the job. Uh, the job is to partner with the next governor and to make sure that she's a success. And it does look like we're going to have a Democratic governor and a female Democratic governor at the end of 2022. And I'm personally committed to doing everything I can to make sure that we do that. We are going to get East-West Rail done. We are going to link our entire state by high-speed rail service from Pittsfield to Boston. I see many familiar names on this call who have worked with us on that effort. It is now at the 20 yard line. It is literally on Joe Biden's desk. We need a governor, a lieutenant governor and a mass stop that actually invests in public transportation and makes this a priority. And by the way, it would be the single biggest climate project in the state's history. It would take thousands of cars off the road, reduce greenhouse gas emissions more than any single investment the state has ever done. And I know we are eager to get to questions. So I just wanna close by just mentioning quickly the governor's council, which is something that I think often gets ignored or, or kind of short shrifted in conversations about the Lieutenant governor. I am an attorney I'm a member of the Massachusetts Bar. I'm vice chair of our Judiciary Committee in the Senate. And I will center criminal justice reform as chair of the Governor's Council. And I will prioritize a diverse judiciary, diverse in every sense, racially diverse, gender, gender diversity, geographic diversity is important too, to make sure that all regions of our state are represented in our judiciary, and also perspective. Governor Baker has appointed, I think, too many prosecutors. We need district, we need um, less prosecutors, frankly, and we need more public defenders, environmental attorneys, public interest lawyers on the bench. And that is something I would focus on as chair of the governor's council, which of course approves all judicial nominations. So I'll stop, I probably went over. Uh, I bear, uh, I, I appreciate everyone bearing with me as the last speaker. Um, and I hope you'll give me some consideration of and my campaign. And I will share in the chat my website, uh, just if people are interested in signing up or, or learning more, or even making a, making a small donation. <laughs> thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Zeta. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right. Well, you you kind of covered some of our questions, so we're just gonna we're just gonna keep it moving. But um, I um, my name is Zaida, and I'm a uh, organizer in uh, Malton, Massachusetts. I'm also a board member here at Progressive Mass. And um, since the pandemic began, one of my uh, passions has been working on the mutual aid front, organizing with other neighbors to try to keep our community intact. Um, so my question, which is very dear to me, is how would you evaluate the state's response to COVID-19? And what would you have done differently? And how can you ensure that the next time something catastrophic happens, that we are prepared to, and to be more resilient? Well, thanks for uh, the question. It's very obviously very urgent right now, uh, and it has been ongoing, and we have to learn uh, from what's happened because there will undoubtedly be another pandemic and another uh, public health crisis, uh, you know, in the near future. First off, there's a few things I would say. Number one, um, and I've been one of the most outspoken critics of Governor Baker uh, in terms of how COVID has uh, been handled. Uh, Joe Comerford chairs our COVID-19 oversight committee that we've participated in actually questioning Governor Baker uh, three different occasions he's come to our committee. There's a couple of things that I think have been the most glaring gap. First of all, the vaccine rollout, especially in the early stages was completely botched. Uh, and I saw this on the ground in Springfield, which is a city I represent. Uh, mm -hmm. The Eastfield Mall, well, first of all, uh, when they first announced the vaccination sites back last year, there wasn't a single one in Hamden County, uh, which is one of the lowest income counties in yep. the state, is home to Springfield, Chicopee, and Holyoke, three gateway cities, as well as many rural communities uh, that lack uh, adequate access to health care and are also plagued by um, significant poverty. Uh, and it wasn't until we actually sounded the alarm as a delegation that they even entertained the idea of putting a uh, location in Springfield. And when they did, they put it at the Eastfield Mall. For people who are familiar with the geography of Springfield, it's far away from transit access. It's, it's on a more suburban part of the city on the border with Wilbraham. Uh, and it's uh, about an hour by bus uh, from downtown. So there were a lot of problems with that site. 
Um, in addition to the issues around uh, the, the, uh, the vaccination outreach, there was inconsistent communication with our boards of health. Uh, they were in fact often giving conflicting guidance to school districts uh, and to boards of health about what they could do, what they couldn't do, when masking was required, when it wasn't. So a few things I would do as Lieutenant Governor is first, we need to build out our public infrastructure for public health. Governor Baker made a policy decision uh, to basically privatize the response and send it out to companies like Curative uh, and other contractors, rather than empowering our local boards of health and our local um, uh, community leaders to be the front door of the response. I would change that. Uh, and I would move back to a public model for public health. Um, the next thing I would do is I would have a much more intentional strategy around neighborhood to neighborhood vaccine outreach. And again, I've seen this in Hamden County, which is one of the lowest vaccinated counties in the state, because again, we have a combination of of, of urban of urban poverty and rural poverty that has created a challenge in getting vaccine access out. We need to localize the vaccine outreach. We need to empower, again, local voices and community voices, and we need to work with trusted partners. Uh, we can't privatize it and have you know, no big contracts going out um, to, uh, you know, to companies based out of state. Uh, running the response. Um, there's there's a lot more there uh, to, to unpack and talk through, but I, I am I am trying to be mindful of the time <laughs> restriction. No worries. No worries. That's not like as it was in your people are questionnaires. These are good compliments to our questionnaire where people can go deeper. Um, you in your opening remarks, you kind of spoke to the question that I've been asking people about the role of the L, kind of like the role of the LG, especially with the governor's council. So I'll, I'll go to one of my next questions about what governors or lieutenant governors either in Massachusetts is past or in other states do you admire and why? And what would you seek to emulate about them or which policy ideas of theirs would you want to introduce or build upon? Yeah, a great, great question. That's a very good question. So, uh, so I, um, you know, a couple of lieutenant governors just around the country that I really admire. I really like, I have a, a lot of admiration for John Fetterman in Pennsylvania. Another mm -hmm. lieutenant governor in, was, in Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes, is a friend of mine. Uh, I've actually had him speak at my class that I teach uh, at the Kennedy School. And um, uh, I think in particular, his response uh, in 2020 and in 2021 to the ongoing racial justice and policing challenges uh, in particular in Wisconsin and how he handled that um, and how he brought voice uh, to those communities and got real reforms done uh, and got real changes done um, is something I really admire. Uh, so his work is, is certainly something I'd want to emulate. Uh, also, uh, closer to home, you know, the reason in part that we have Worcester Boston Rail Service is because after the Obama stimulus in 2009, Governor Patrick turned to Tim Murray, who was his lieutenant governor, and said, get this moving so that we can get Worcester Boston service done. Of course, Tim Murray was the previous mayor of Worcester. He understood how important that link was. And the proof is in the pudding. About 10 years ago, that link got set up. Worcester is now the second largest city in New England. Its population went up 14% between the 2010 census and the 2020 census. So it shows what can happen when you have a Lieutenant Governor working in a focused way on a complicated project like that. So now we've got to get the service Worcester West to Springfield uh, and to Pittsfield. So I'd say, you know, those three uh, would, would be the ones um, that, I, that I would look to the closest. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, quick uh, kind of softball question. Who are your political role models and why? I appreciate that. I appreciate that question. I mean, certainly, uh, well, certainly President Obama. Uh, I had the honor of working very closely with him for more than four years, uh, being in a lot of long drives with him and late night flights. And uh, I must say he's someone that threw a whole lot of stuff that was thrown at him, some incredibly vicious and nasty and racist. I never once saw him lose his cool or, or lose his temper. And um, he's always just been you know, a, a, a deep role model for me on a, on a very fundamental level. Uh, and I would say, um, you know, through history, probably the leaders that I admire the most are probably FDR uh, and what the New Deal meant, you know, for Massachusetts and for um, our country uh, and the, the country we had after FDR's presidency versus the one before uh, and, um, and probably Martin Luther King as well. 
And then, so we've all been spending probably far too much time at home during the during the pandemic. So what is your favorite binge watch that you've discovered? Uh, well, I just wrapped up Curb Your Enthusiasm. So <laughs> uh, that, yeah, that, and, I, and I've got to, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I got to say Veep and I highly recommend Veep. Uh, I worked I worked on, on the Veep team for eight seasons and um, excuse me, seven seasons. And, uh, you know, sometimes it hits a little a little close to home, but uh, I, I would I would have to say those two. Good choice. Thanks so much. Um, so last uh, last question. Um, after talking to a voter on the door, how would you want them to describe you to other people? No, that's a really nice question. I mean, I, I think maybe earnest. I, I try. I mean, I I try to do my best and uh, try to get try to get things done. And uh, you know, I hope they may maybe come away with the impression that you know I'm you know doing do, we're doing our best here to try to try, try to move some issues forward. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you again so much for spending time in the afternoon with us. And before we let you go, if people, you noted this earlier, but if people want to learn more about you and your campaign, where should they go? So they can uh, check out my website, ericlusser.com. Uh, we've got a, a form on there also, if you're interested in, in helping us at the convention, I'd be honored if you'd be willing to serve as a delegate. Uh, people can also, um, you know, call or email me. It's very easy. Uh, it's just eric at ericlesser.com uh, or info at ericlesser.com. Uh, and you can also check out my, uh, my website where you can sign up for updates, join our email list, all that. Awesome.